just to say good morning and you're all very, very welcome uh, to this morning's State of the Union Address. Uh, for those of you that don't know, although it's so great to see so many familiar faces, uh, my name is Derv MacDonald and it's a real privilege for me to chair uh, once again uh, this morning's session, which as we know um, is being organised with the European Commission representation here in Ireland by the European Parliament Liaison Office and the IIEA in Dublin. Um, it's really wonderful to meet. I think last year it was uh, all online and um, so many of us. A uh, warm welcome to everybody who's joining us on YouTube. I know there are huge numbers who registered for that this morning, so um, thank you. And wherever you are, we hope you will be joining in the conversation with us um, later. Just um, a quick run on the running order. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce our panellists. It all depends on how quickly events uh, get underway. Um, we will be switching as soon as the Parliament is ready to the uh, live stream of President von der Leyen's address, her third uh, such address. Possibly an hour, we're thinking, um, for the uh, address to take place, um, but you will get a chance to take part in the uh, discussion. Um, those here in Dublin in the audience can participate in the Q&A by just raising your hand and letting us know. Anyone else who's joining us on YouTube or elsewhere on the live stream, you can send in your Q&A through the Zoom function and we will get to as many of them as possible. Um, so su submit them during the Q&A function and whether you're here or elsewhere, do let us know. Um, who you are when you get your question. Um, for those who are in the room, just as a courtesy to our contributors, if you could put your phones on um, silent. Without further ado, let me introduce you uh, to our panel, uh, none of whom needs any introduction, to Bridget Laffin, Professor Emeritus and former Director of the Robert Schumann Centre for Advanced Studies at the EU Institute in Florence. You're very, very welcome, uh, Bridget. Alice Mary Higgins, uh, on my far right, is an independent senator in Shannon Aaron, where she leads a civil engagement group, and she's a member of so many committees, Environment, Climate Action, Finance and Public Expenditure and Reform. John O'Brennan, who uh, almost gave me a little heart attack because he didn't know where he was, because he went to the wrong Mount Street. Uh, he is <laughs> the Jean Monnet Chair in European Integration and Director for the Centre of European and Eurasian Studies at Maynooth. And last but not least, we are joined by David O'Sullivan, who is the IAEA Director General, um, amongst many, many other accomplishments. I think we can see a very, very prominent theme, which is going to set the scene for much of the address um, this morning. What I'm going to do is we're going to have just maybe some brief initial thoughts from everyone here on the panel and as soon as we see it go live we will join um, the address. Um, Bridget Laffin, I might just start with you. Um, Europe it seems and certainly since um, President von der Leyen has taken over it seems to be one existential crisis after another. What are you looking out for this morning? So the first thing I would say is we've actually got to stop using the word existential when it comes to the EU because everyone says every crisis is existential and it survives them all. The EU is not an existential crisis, it will survive this one as but well. significant, significant oh, challenges no, of facing. Course. Huge, huge. I would say uh, this is a State of the Union speech like no other. Uh, it's uh, at a time when Europe is at war, when war has returned to Europe. So I would say, I would watch the tone. Let's see how she frames this because she knows all governments are facing very sensitive issues as well. So what, what I would say we should, we should pay attention to, to, to tone. And then I think in terms of what, what will be majored on, Clearly Ukraine, uh, and Ukraine in terms of geopolitics, because um, we, Europe has fretted a lot about geopolitics in terms of supply chains in China, that remains, but now uh, it's hard geopolitics as well. Clearly the uh, energy crisis, I think she will make proposals on energy, she has to, the ministers met last Friday, it's, it's the top issue for the winter. Uh, and the broader social impact, inflation, the impact on families, the cost of living crisis and all of that. Uh, clearly climate and climate transition. Uh, and then I would say she will remind the EU, the member states and the citizens, because I think she'll try to speak to the citizens as well today, that when Europe hangs together, when there's solidarity, then it's stronger. So I would say that she will argue that this crisis, Europe has to be united, has to be, um, uh, has to be at one, and only if it's at one can it pull through. And then finally, I would say you get something from the <coughs> comments on the future of Europe. I don't expect anything on Brexit, but some reference to the Queen. 
And obviously Olga Zelensky, John, um, receiving um, an applause there this morning. Um, there is now a State of the Union political bingo game you can play. You can guess uh, what is going to come up in the speech. What do you think is not going to come up? What do you think will, might be omitted? Well, uh, energy, Ukraine and tackling democracy. I think those are obviously mm. the, the, the three things that are most important. I'd be very interested in the light of the revelations yesterday about Russia's sponsoring of extreme parties and disruption in democracies in the West, what she's going to say about that, because obviously there are member states of the European Union where the rule of law is in a pretty dreadful state and there have been regular criticisms of the Commission that it hasn't acted sufficiently. <coughs> or sufficiently robustly to protect democracy in Hungary, Poland and elsewhere. I'd be, it's a sensitive issue, um, ongoing negotiations with both Budapest and Warsaw about uh, commitments that they have made around rule of law issues, but it's sensitive for a whole variety of reasons. And um, there we are, um, very much on time this year. Let's cross over Never to the uh, John and David. Um, there, we won't get to everything, obviously, David, um, at the Opening, Bridget invited us to um, pay attention to the tone. Um, it began with, we will be tested, we will prevail. The Ukraine crisis showed uh, Europe at its best. What were your initial thoughts? Well, you know, I, I can be a bit of cynic occasionally. You know, 40, 40 years of working in the European institutions, I've seen a lot of things come and go. I've, I've written a few of these speeches. I have to say, I thought that was genuinely inspiring. I, I thought it was a remarkable uh, speech. Uh, I thought she really captured the mood. Um, I think the Commission's communication skills have improved remarkably, Barbara, um, uh, from, from the early days when, you know, we were very clumsy. I think it has. But I, I just, I really just felt she, she really captured the mood. Um, I mean, we can discuss, you know, some of the details. I'm sure the proposal for a European Convention will have a few member states scratching their heads. Uh, but I thought, you know, her, her basic emphasis on values on what we stand for on, on the the challenge which the war russian war in ukraine poses not just to you know a military situation or, or, or the, the independence of ukraine but to what we stand for what 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 kind of future we have the link between the energy crisis climate change the emphasis on the need to kind of have a new a new economic and social model, business model, to adapt to the, the, the changing situation. Uh, the, the, the reference to uh, young people, of course, uh, because I, I think we all know this is, this is a very real challenge with a, a generation feeling perhaps that my generation uh, hasn't left them in, in as good a shape as we were able to be. So I, I honestly, um, chapeau, I, I thought she really, it was an excellent speech. And you know, you have to bear in mind that she's speaking in three languages, uh, uh, English is not her native language, but I, I really thought she... The only thing that disappointed me, if I may say so, was on the Parliament side, there were quite a few empty seats, mostly on the right-hand side of the hemicycle, but honestly, all throughout it, I, I thought the Parliament let itself down a bit there by not, uh, by not turning out in, in full force. I mean, if you go to the State of the Union uh, in Washington, which I had the privilege to do on, on four occasions, I mean, it's literally there are people sitting on the steps. Uh, so I, I thought maybe that was a lost opportunity for the Parliament to, to assert its, its, its role. But otherwise, honestly, excellent performance. I mean, then we can discuss some of yeah. the proposals are controversial, some of them will be, you know, some of it will maybe not go as, travel as far as we might like it to, but uh, I, I, one of the best speeches I've, I've heard from a President of the Commission in a long time. Alice Mary, uh, courage, solidarity, these were the big, big themes. It was the, certainly the frame within everything was set. Um, it, it was amazing to see all the female leaders uh, as they could all out in their blue and yellow. Certainly that was the, the big, big support. But beyond Ukraine, and I suppose the, uh, the connections between the Russian aggression and the energy crisis. Looking at the temporary and exclusionary uh, measures being um, proposed in respect of energy and the companies, and also her comments in respect of not just household, but also SMEs facing what she described as both inflation and uncertainty. Do you think um, the speech delivered on what is, I suppose, heating and eating, I think? We can reduce it down to is what most people yeah. um, are, are worried about going into winter. 
Um, I think there was really interesting, so on energy, a lot of it is some of which we've seen, we knew coming out of the meeting of energy min ministers, um, the, the, the direction, but I thought it was, there were some very interesting things around energy because there are those temporary measures that we've heard about, but she did also talk about that kind of almost structural reform of the market. So mm. there's kind of those, um, it's interesting that we're seeing, you know, the fact that the need for different measures in how, for example, gas is being treated and how renewables are, and in a way it's a different, if we look just back one year when you had the taxonomy and the kind of an attempt to kind of blend together gas and renewables we are seeing this acknowledgement of very different strategies and very different approaches needed on both and I thought I was very struck by that you know we had the car free weekends but the same road so what I thought was interesting was these kind of emergency measures that are there that idea of you know the capping of prices and so forth but also the recognition for the need for radical reform in the market and I wonder will it leave to a shift away from that gas approach on the economic the eating and you know heating the basic need piece was covered but I, I, I must say I have a little bit of concerns just around some of how you know there seemed to be a little bit of a rollback around towards the the old fiscal rule framework so the idea of you know strategic investment being excluded and there is a real debate there because you know things like education that were being spoken about very strongly and repeatedly by by, by um, the Commission president some of those are not going to fit a strategic investment frame within, for example, the semester process and others because they don't deliver an immediate financial benefit, but they're crucial for society. So I suppose the social spending piece, I, I'm left with a few question marks around, is there really support for social spending? Are we going to, you know, for example, it was sustain that idea of spending sustainably, but, but what about, you know, the sustainable development goals and this whole picture? Not all of them fit an investment return mechanism. Just remind everybody, um, if they're using, there's three handles, at EU Ireland, at EP in Ireland, and at IIEA, and using the hashtag SOTEU22. Um, coming back to you, uh, Bridget, obviously that 140 billion being promised by the crisis levy, or um, uh, looking at the, the companies, but also this notion of a hydrogen bank, and the delicate balance between um, reducing the gas dependency and particularly the Russian supply but also trying to meet the emerging, well not emerging, the full-blown climate crisis that we're facing. <coughs> That's a very, very delicate balance and you could really see her trying to make those connections uh, between both. Absolutely and of course uh, energy dependency, has, which Europe walked into and Germany in particular, has proved to be one of Europe's Achilles heels and now the shock of Ukraine means that that is being addressed, will be addressed. Uh, but of course we also have the, the climate crisis. For me, I, I think the strategic actually matters a lot. Why? Because Europe needs to be, the world is shifting very dramatically and Europe has got to be very strategic about its political economy, its energy, the it's re we're now in a time when 30, Europe in 30 years will be determined a lot by what we do over the next 10 to 15 years. So I welcome anything that makes Europe more strategic, anything that makes Europe look at uh, not to become protectionist, because that won't work, but understands that dependency, strategic autonomy has, has meat. And so I really welcome the strategic discussion around energy, uh, because also it's intergenerational. If we don't get this right, we're really the cost will be borne by the next which generation. Which was her final point when she was building up towards the European Convention, Convention, which we will get to. But it was interesting when you said not protectionist, and yet when she was talking in the context, uh, Bridget, of the new European <coughs> Sovereignty Fund, she was talking about a future of Europe made in Europe, even the uh, Critical Materials Act. It is not quite Tax uh, uh, Cuts and Jobs Act, but you did get a sense of a bringing it back home, a sufficiency on the continent. So I think Europe is not saying no to globalisation. What Europe is saying now is shifting globalisation in certain ways that suit us better. In other words, breaking that dependency because it, I can't remember wh the, the dependency on China was 90%, for it was 60% for lithium and 90% for something else. But that's too high. 
That's yeah. way too high. That's handing China huge power. So, and the other thing I would say is we're also seeing an EU emerge where public finance plays a very important role in the future. There was historically Europe's main public power was regulation. That continues to be important. But here we're seeing the development of a public finance Europe that's very different to the old budgets that I wrote a book about in the, in the 1990s. And that's something I think to watch. But I do think we are seeing, I've argued since Brexit, we have seen and are seeing a very new European Union emerge. And to me, everything she said today confirms the fact that Europe is trying, and it's extremely difficult because of heterogeneity and difference, to really respond to the world that Europe finds itself in, rather than the Europe that Europe would, the world that Europe would want. Europe always would prefer if the world was more like Europe. We now know it's not. So it's very good that the wake-up call in Europe, that the world, we now have to face a world that isn't entirely of our making, but we have to try to steer a pathway through that world. Uh, and it's, none of this is easy. None of this. Is, there isn't any easy public <laughs> policy challenge here. And that includes, I suppose, uh, John, um, foreign policy, um, two major issues in respect of accession, but also democracy. She spoke of the need for a defence of democracy pact and also um, huge support uh, for you know Georgia, Moldova, for Ukraine at the heart of Europe. But even that is not as easy as it sounds. No, it isn't. I agree with Bridget. The Commission set out a, an ambition at the beginning of von der Leyen's term to be a geopolitical commission, and I think yep. we're getting there. It is becoming more strategic in all kinds of senses. Uh, but specifically on um, accession, I noted that, and I agree with David, it was the finest State of the Union speech that I have seen. Um, but the language she used at the beginning about Ukraine was very, very emphatic, I think. And she came back to it when she spoke about defending democracy, um, attacking corruption within the European Union, and so on. Um, Which got huge applause. It got a within, lot of applause. Within Europe, within the continent, that, that she identified that, and I note that uh, Emily O'Reilly also wrote a salient piece earlier um, this week, uh, pointing uh, to issues of that, of the need for Europe to get its house in order before it tells others, yeah, including I, accession countries. I think the reason that you saw that kind of response in the Parliament is that the Parliament is to some extent significantly ahead of the Commission and has been very critical of the failures of the Commission over many years to adequately tackle on behalf of the EU mm -hmm. the abuses of power that we have seen in Hungary, in Poland and elsewhere. Um, I noted, however, on accession where she mentioned Ukraine, Moldova mm -hmm. and um, Georgia. Georgia. Uh, she didn't mention the Western Balkans, to my mm -hmm. mind. And this is the most fragile region of Europe. These countries were promised European Union membership in Thessaloniki in 2003. So mm -hmm. they've been waiting two <coughs> decades. They have essentially been flatline along, flatlining along this trajectory of broken promises. There's absolutely no incentive for reform. Yesterday we saw an ultra-nationalist government in Serbia cancelling the Euro Pride uh, Festival, which is supposed to take place this weekend in Belgrade. It was merely the latest indication of just how distant Serbia is from membership. And also just to hear John say, you know, we'll continue to, you know, defend the independence of the judiciary, you know, as if that is something that needed to be said um, in the heart um, of Europe. I'm going to uh, go to the panel um, because, David, you identified um, correctly what a lot of people would be interested in. This is, we have a question from Anouk Moula, who's a student in uh, Ren Political Science Institute in France. Uh, she says, first, she's very impressed by the solidarity shown to Ukraine and in a way, she says to Uyghur, she said, I have a lingering question, as you had after listening to President van der Leyen. What does the panel think she means with this European Convention? And could you explore what that goal and form of this initiative might be, not least because treaty change, of course, is accompanied by referenda, certainly in this jurisdiction? Well, I mean, I think this is ultimately, you know, w one of the more difficult challenges we're going to face in the next few years, because uh, as 
the president said, and I don't think she, John, I think you're a bit harsh. I don't think she was really, she mentioned the Western Balkans. They clearly, I mean, we have, you know, I think it's 10 countries lined up for accession. She didn't mention Turkey, uh, which is, you know, which is a candidate country, but where the things are not going very well. It is clear that if we are talking about a further expansion of the European Union of that scale, we need internal reform. We are, we are not capable of absorbing 10 new countries with our existing structures and systems. Um, and but nobody really wants to, to, to engage in that discussion, and, and this, is, this is the challenge. Uh, so, I mean, what she meant by European Convention, I mean, she specifically mentioned it strangely, I thought, about intergenerational solidarity. I mean, it seemed to be a rather limited uh, thing, because if you, if, you, if you start a discussion about reforming the treaties, it, w it will run m m much, much broader than that. What she actually uh, said was it's time to enshrine solidarity between generations in, in our, our treaties, family, yes. full stop, and then the moment has arrived for a European yes. Convention. So I was trying to see... Yeah, I, well, the, I'm, the assuming, I'm assuming that, yes, she was specifically mentioning that, but she, she knows, as everyone does, that if you launch a European Convention on, on institutional reform and treaty reform, it will have a much broader Asmir, agenda. what were your thoughts on that? Yeah, I thought it was very interesting. I mean, I was a member of the Future of Europe process, and uh, I suppose... I'm looking to, you know, some of the focus was around the, the things that involved treaty change, but there was a lot of other recommendations, some of which we're still seeing, you know, which, which there's no obstacle to moving forward on that haven't yet been moved forward. And so I suppose when we saw it, I was, I was wondering, I mean, is that, is that the youth test that we've, you know, has been promised? How much progress could be made on the youth test, you know, without or previous to a convention? You know, the fundamental rights. So one of the issues, if I look to the issues that had really strong messages from those participating, that idea of, most people already think in Europe we found that the Charter of Fundamental Rights is part of the rule of law, but of course it, it's not, and that's why in the rule of law engagement at the moment with Hungary you know, Poland, it's focusing on, on procurement, on corruption, on the financial issues, whereas a lot of the public concern has been on those issues of the breaching of fundamental rights. So, you know, is it a convention around the protection of fundamental rights? Is that what we mean by do no harm? Yeah. Or, is there going to be something pushed out front and then there's a whole load of other issues that are probably more controversial that maybe weren't touched, talked about in terms of the convention around the processes. So I think there's a, it's one of those areas where more definitely needs, but the principle of a convention has been pushed for by the parliament. The question of is it a convention about, about how we work, in, you know, is it a convention around um, strengthening those individual rights and for me I certainly had a sense that there were certain issues supported more uh, from the Convention on the Future of Europe than others. It was sort of a big tease at the end. It was very much a yeah. tease. Um, the youth test that yeah. going to be the, the showpiece. I think it was probably um, what, what is the Convention probably or what does it mean? Bridget, can I go back to you just on the Green Deal agenda, which I know is a, a subject that is close to your heart because, you know, you read the business pages, there are countries that are trying to prevent a Lehman-like response, huge liquidity uh, crisis for many companies um, that are facing collateral obligations. Some of the things that she was talking about the measures um, both on a standalone basis and collectively are actually you're talking about major structural reform to key utility markets and speaking to you know that earlier discussion does it have the institutional and governance capacity do you think to address all of that um, because th th those are things we can try to tackle immediately but that have long-term market implications absolutely I, I so I think that what the war in Ukraine has done is it, it has exposed and made, firstly made more urgent the climate issues and the acceleration of the climate crisis itself, but it has also exposed the pain involved. In other words, this is the mother of all collective action problems. I think what she was saying about the market for electricity, that's been on the agenda forever and ever and ever. I, in my last life uh, in Schumann, we had what was called the Florence School of Regulation, which was set up after something called the Florence Forum on Electricity Markets, which started tackling the utility, the monopoly problem. And the of course, these are very big monopolies, they're very powerful and very hard to change. But now we're in a new game and a new, there's a new stage. And Europe has tended to find the governance capacities, either formally or informally, and also cross the levels when it needs to. So I would expect that it, it will, I think it will be extreme, it is very urgent and will, uh, and will be addressed. But the, 
what we still, the, the struggle in Europe will be the impact of all of it, not just on our SMEs, but on e each of us as individuals, households and all that. And Are us turning the lights out when the last uh, visit You know, goes? exactly. The Tower, yeah. The, the kind of, uh, all of that. And so I, I think that's, uh, that's such a big societal shift mm. that it requires more than government. That's a pact with society to change how, how we are. And of course, what Europe does on the climate crisis in and of itself is simply not enough. Mm. So that's also the partnership uh, with other parts of the world. But I do think what we've seen uh, over the last, in an accelerated way over the last number of years is we can't hide from the climate crisis anymore. No. Can I, uh, do, I just before we go, and I will be taking questions, to, um, I want to go to Alice and John on um, just, uh, an issue relating to the rule of law it was interesting. We can't get through the entire speech, but when she was talking about that incident in Amsterdam last year, the um, creation of various institutes, the disinformation campaign is not just being waged by bots outside of uh, the, the union. It is very much something that is alive and central here. And although courage, solidarity were the big themes, the energy crisis, the um, you know the general political division, the culture wars, everything. Is, is a challenge to social cohesion within the Union? Yeah, uh, on China, I think the EU has been late to wake up to the nature of the threat, but it has. And the Amsterdam case was replicated here in Ireland, you may remember, when uh, an academic at UCD who was raising serious issues about human rights, the treatment of the Uyghur population, for example, in Western China, um, we then saw the Chinese government try to put pressure on the Department of Foreign Affairs and the government. To the great credit of his department, Bridget's old department, they absolutely supported him solidly. But it's an indication of the insidious ways in which China has tried to insert these soft power instruments into uh, the member states of the Union. So I think we have to be very careful. The universities, I think, are really should do a complete inventory of all our links with China. And I would suggest that we should divest almost completely from China because we'll be in the same sort of situation that many were in in terms of their institutional links with Russia. Um, because Xi Jinping's um, um, kind of much more muscular Chinese foreign policy suggests that that problem is certainly not going to go away and it's probably going to get worse in the years ahead. Can I just, uh, just on Alice Murray, just on that social um, cohesion, particularly when the reality is winter is coming and people are going to be under so much pressure, as uh, President von der Leyen said, we will be tested. Yes, yeah, so just really quickly though on, on the human rights piece, because I did want to add in, it was something, I, we, we do need that human rights regime that was tested, that there is consistency around the human rights testing. So we know that, you know, there's a rightful, you know, move away from Russian gas, but we also need to be looking at the human rights issues in relation to Saudi Arabia and, the, and for example, in relation to, uh, there are concerns around, even under Repower EU, some of the agreements signed, for example, with Israel that are not as clear about occupied territories. So there's a few, I think, for Europe to be strong on that human rights piece, it, we will need to be shown to be applying it very strongly in all of our agreements. And of course, in terms of things like lithium, that's going to be, we know that the trade agreements with Chile are being renegotiated and that's going to have to be, you know, there's been some concern. I, I saw the, the decolonization. talked about the need to build up strategic reserves. Yes, and of being, in terms of being strategic is really important, but it's also important there's a strong ethic in that. And I thought, you know, we saw the decolonize uh, Russia poster that is there. When we talk about the world that Europe finds itself in, Europe did shape a lot of that world and needs to acknowledge that. And that's where things like, going and having an impact in the climate talks will mean that Ireland, that Europe and Ireland <laughs> need to be contributing around things like the climate justice and the 100 billion followed in that regard. But on social cohesion, and that's what I say strategic, I'm not saying let's not have strategy. The question is what do we mean by strategic? And I think it was acknowledged the errors, the, the, the years it took in terms of the financial crisis, partly because there was not enough strategic emphasis placed on social cohesion. And that was something that then in the COVID crisis, Europe said social cohesion needs to be a priority. So when we talk about strategic, I'm just saying it's very important that in our financial solutions and in our instruments, even especially in, in the changes to our economic governance, that we make sure that social investment in social cohesion 
is recognised as strategic as well. And I think that's going to be crucial. It, it's good that there's going to be pricing impacts from the energy piece. Uh, I, I think the idea of that collective public spending, I think that the return of public spending for making the changes we need, as was mentioned. We didn't even get, I think, the 100 billion spent under the uh, next gen, about 700 I, million to and go. And I think that's, that's really positive as well. I'm going to, uh, is, there, is there a mic for everyone in the room? There is. Um, so put your hand up. Before um, I come to you, David, uh, I'll give you an easy question here from uh, Paul O'Dwyer, formerly of the Department of Finance. He wonders whether the rapid deepening of EU integration in response to recent crises is leading us. He wants to know where is that leading us. He said, are we seeing the emergence of a European super state? So an easy one for you. No, look, I, I, I really, this European super state is a complete myth. It's, it's not the model we're following. What we are doing is building something completely unique in international relationship, which is building a voluntary union of sovereign states who act collectively where it delivers better outcomes than can be delivered by, by, by individual countries. That's what it is. So it's, it's wrong to compare it to a country like the United States or like France or, or, like, uh, or even a, a federal state like, like Australia or, or, or Canada. It, that's not what we're doing. Uh, and we, we, we have to stop constantly trying to make it look like it's, 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 it, is a, it is a country. It, we're building a unique model and we have to find unique ways of doing it. That reflects the institutional setup. Uh, we have to also recognize that our people are deeply attached to their national identity, their language, their history, their culture. People do not want to lose that. But on the other hand, as the president said, we absolutely know that as individual countries, we are much less powerful, much less capable of of delivering for our citizens than when we act together. Uh, and, but you have to demonstrate that case by case, and it changes. Who would have thought we would have had common procurement on vaccines until the pandemic came? Now we have to reform our, our energy market in a way which will be much more integrated because of the war in Ukraine and because of the, the consequences and for climate change. So it's an evolving process. Uh, I, th there will be a tendency if we enlarge further if we get to, uh, I think it's potentially, at the moment it's 10 countries are sort of candidate stages. That takes us to 37 countries. That's not going to be, you know, a, a federal state run with a central government. So this balance between doing things collectively at, at a central level with, with real institutions, with a rule of law and governance over those institutions, but at the same time maximizing the autonomy and the capacity of individual countries to choose their own way of life is, 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 is the model. Um, are you okay for about another eight to ten minutes because I do want to get to everyone on the floor if um, you're okay with that um, Barbara and um, there's a lady here just in the third row and again if you just let us know who you are and where you're from as you uh, pose your question to the panel thank you. Thank you so much and thank you for the invite it's great to be here with European and global friends my name is Marja Skoyer I'm the Norwegian ambassador uh, so I'm very happy to partake in this uh, discussion and listen to this spe speech which was really really very good Norway and the EU enjoys a very close partnership. Of course, the EEA is the fundament for this, but we have also 70 other agreements between Norway and the EU. And we are like-minded in foreign policy and security policy and solidarity with Ukraine and so on and so forth. So we share, we share the objectives, we share the visions, we stand solidaric. Uh, and we, of course, we are a reliable and predictable partner to the EU, not only in the current energy crisis, but also with the visions for the Green Deal in democracy, rule of law. And uh, I would encourage all our EU colleagues to engage with us at the political level, of course, but also at other levels, because we need to prepare the decisions. We need to engage in this discussion if we're going to find a way out of the current crisis. I would like to ask the panel how you see Norway as a predictable partner and solid partner to the EU. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador John. Oh, um, for sure, Norway is a truly you important hand up if you'd like partner. To, yeah, just, I'm going to try and keep everyone going while you answer, so put your hand up if you'd like to ask a question. Thank uh, you. I also note that Norway has been incredibly generous to Ukraine, looking at financial dispersals and things of that in recent uh, times. Um, I know also that Norway might have been a member. We're coming up to our 50th anniversary uh, membership. Uh, Norway had that choice, but I mean, it's locked into a relationship with the European Union that's very positive for uh, both sides. And I think the Ukraine war has only enhanced all of that. It's not just about Finland and Sweden 
you know, changing their minds about NATO, Denmark closer to European security policy, opting into that. Um, Norway is also part of this because it's part of that ring of structures that surround the European Union. Um, it's all for the good, in my view. That's great. Have we any more questions uh, from the floor? Don't be shy. This gentleman here in front, and actually this gentleman at the back. So we'll take those two, maybe two of the two questions and uh, throw them to the panel. Thanks. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Andy Maguire from TU Dublin. I I'm asking you a question, maybe similar to Norway, but it's, it's in, with relevance to Ireland. I have four children. Um, they emigrate. Um, they're emigrating during a good time. They emigrate to the Anglo-American countries. They don't emigrate to Europe, where there's, as uh, uh, the, uh, the, the president said, um, there's shortage of labour. They're highly skilled. They're from a very good background. Um, and if you're from Balbriggan or Bally de Hob, I think if you're going to emigrate or if you're going to leave the island, the tendency is to go to Anglo-American cultures. So, how can we, I'm a completely a farms European, had the pleasure of studying in Leuven, lived in Italy, um, how can we as an island or Ireland contribute more to Europe and get ourselves more in the European vein? Um, because we might end up becoming a small little talking shop, um, not really of relevance. Yeah. Um, I might uh, throw that to you, uh, Bridget, having um, you know, been in Florence and been at the heart of that. It, it, we, we didn't get to everything, but obviously education and skills was a major, major part of this. She said 2023 had to be the year of education and training. So I, I think the answer to your question is that migration tends to follow migratory pathways. And so if historically, the, I mean, in, in an earlier period of European history, the Irish uh, went to the continent and then they started to go both to the, to the Anglo world. So I think there's that. I think it's English. Yes. It's the ease with which Irish people can rock up to an English speaking country and, and settle in and our, there's not just uh, a resistance to language uh, acquisition in Ireland now, but the numbers doing French and German are, are down. And I think that's an enormous problem, not just for us in terms of skills and education, but just culturally. Yeah. I think just culturally it impoverishes us to be locked into a, a only, predominantly into uh, an Anglo world. But I would say also don't underestimate the number of Irish people across the continent. Yeah. What it's, I mean, there are 50 plus Gaelic football teams on the continent. That means there are a lot of Irish in a lot of places. So I, I. I understand the, the draw of English, but I think there are migratory flows to the continent as well. And very vibrant Irish communities in Brussels, in, in Italy where I live, there was, there were, the Irish were there too. So, but I do think language acquisition uh, in our educational system is something. Also for the other big issue for the Irish is the generation, David's generation, have, are leaving or have left the commission and we now need people to take jobs in the institutions who are good enough, have the language skills to get those jobs because if we don't we lose soft power and it's of immense importance that Ireland finds it has sufficient numbers of high quality people in the institutions at senior ranks. If we don't, it's a problem. Okay, this gentleman here to our left. Thank you, uh, Bridget. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, and thank you for the event. It's very, very nice to be out at an in-person event. I keep saying it. Uh, Dual Tobrin from Meta, um, and I'm going to ask probably an unfair question, uh, given that we've all just heard about the convention and, and the reform. But would the panel care to speculate on what type of timeline we might be looking at? Um, if we're talking about the type of targeted reform potentially that Senator Higgins mentioned, or a broader piece. Thank you. David, what do you um, think, just in terms of how that? How long is a piece of string, you know? I mean, look, we, 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 we've been here before. We, we, we know that 
A, there will be a lot of resistance from member states because it doesn't really fit with national politics in, in, in any country at the moment. Nobody wants to have another referendum on, on Europe. Um, so there will be resistance. On the other hand, there's, there's an issue there that needs to be addressed and it's not going to go away. So my guess is eventually it will be set up, but it will, it, will, it will take time because it will need a moment when people feel we've arrived at a point where you can have this debate nationally. And I, we're not there yet, it's clear. Uh, so I, I, we're probably talking about several years in my view. And certainly before you would get to a text of an, amending the treaties, uh, you know, that's, that's going to take, this is a, this is a medium term project. But I, th I think it's, what was significant was that she had the courage to, to, to call for it. And in, what I, impresses me with President von der Leyen is, you know, she's more often than not slightly ahead of the posse uh, on a number of issues, on candidacy for Ukraine, on, on the, the, the reform and recovery fund, uh, on the procurement for the pandemic. So she does take some risk because, you know, the member states are not necessarily going to follow you. And, and it's, I've worked with many presidents of the commission. You're always nervous if I go out there and say we should do this and then everyone says no. But she takes some risk. And, and I think uh, today, not, not only was it a fine speech, but she had the courage to put that out there. It's, it's, a, delic it's a controversial issue and it, it, it won't immediately take root, but uh, we will remember that this was perhaps I think it certainly had a desired effect because we're all talking about it. Barbara, no. Yeah. Hello, uh, Barbara Nolan, Head of the European Commission representation here. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, ev all the audience for coming, our panel. Uh, I think I would agree with David that, you know, it was, I think, one of the best, the best, if not the best speeches I've seen. Um, I would say that, wouldn't I? Would. In the immortal <laughs> words of Mandy yes. Rice Davis or whatever, whoever said it. Um, but I do think that it was a courageous speech. I think it struck the right tone. I'd just like to come back, John, on what you said. In fact, I'm reading the line here. Yeah, she did mention So that I want the Balkans. people of the Western Balkans, of Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia to know you are part of our family, your future is in our union, and our union is not complete without you. So she did mention it. I think, to be fair, she is um, probably she's been really at the forefront of recognizing the importance of the Western Balkans and the importance of bringing them into the European family and stabilizing uh, the situation so I think you know she's sort of stuck her neck out if you like on that uh, at a time when maybe other heads of state and government aren't so convinced yeah, that exactly. this is yeah. the right Problems time within yeah. the council and not within um, I am determined to get you out by 9.40 so uh, very very quickly I'm going to go to the panel um, we're midterm but it's a term um, like no other um, so just maybe just from each of you just some concluding remarks before we bring the event to a close um, I think she's been a very good president I think putting climate change at the heart of the Commission's program was um, the right thing to do we've seen it replicated in the COVID recovery funds climate change spending is about a third or more of what governments are spending uh, but to go back to our last point, there's only so much that the Commission can do. It can set the agenda, it can put policy proposals out there as it did with the energy proposals last week. But as ever within the Union, a system of divided government, it is very, very difficult to reconcile, even within the Council, 27 different national positions and then to match the ambition that's often put out there by a commission president in these proposals. Alice, but I think it's, yeah. a, it's more or less a positive report positive. card at half time. And for you, Alice Murray. Um, I think it is around making sure that those wider frames, that go wider than the EU, the human, human rights frame, for example, that that is kept peace. So migration was mentioned in that, and I thought it was interesting she mentioned there's going to be negotiations around the migration pact for the next uh, four presidencies. Uh, it's not been just signaled. Ukraine. It's not, and so it's not just Ukraine. That idea of that being a model for was very interesting to me in terms of does that mean that we're putting a kind of human centre? And that came out of the future of Europe very strongly. Then within our energy policy again climate. So you have to look to those things that we can do in terms of in Europe, but that we frame it within that wider human rights frame internationally and within the wider, you know, we, we said we, existential is overused, not in terms of climate crisis. It is in that sense. So I think that's crucial even, and there are a lot of battles still, you know, the hydrogen strategy. Is that going to be green hydrogen or is it going to be a, a last other pass for the gas industry? You know, there's a lot of debates within what she said, but I think, uh, I did think it was a strong speech and I think it opened up and made clear lots of key decision points. And I think it'll be over the next year and six months that we see unpack what the different arguments are within them. 
Yeah, David, uh, the State of the Union, it is sort of a, a, something of a US um, import, but how important do you think it is for the legislative agenda? And when you know, she's talking about, you know, new iterations of the CHIPS Act, you know, for lithium, for other um, uh, critical materials and stuff. Um, what do you think are the, the chances of realistically in implementing many of the things she outlined today? Well, I mean, if you if you watch the State of America, State of Union speech in, in America, you know, it's it's an event in and of itself. It tends not to have much of an impact afterwards, right? It's 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 a it's a media show. She has borrowed some of the the elements, the special guests, uh, the kind of trying to make it personal. You know, the reference to the two Polish girls uh, and their work for refugees. Um, but I I I think the, you know, she has announced that this commission has honestly produced a fantastic output in, in, under huge <coughs> pressure. Um, and I, I honestly, I think they have delivered. Um, I think the challenge, the tectonic plates are shifting internationally. And we have to define what that means for the EU 27, what it means for our neighborhood, those of our neighbors who never want to be members or unlikely ever to be members, the UK, Norway, Switzerland, uh, uh, but who are still strong partners, those of our neighbors who want to join and how do we manage that and how do we then fit internationally United States, China, Russia obviously uh, in a very difficult place at the moment. This is, this is the challenge and at the same time meeting the, the, the issue of climate change which is the single greatest challenge we face and I, I think this commission has done a good job of framing that. Then, you know, can we agree at 27? More often than not, yes, but never quite to the level of expectation which is made in the speech. Uh. And the last word to you, Bridget Laffin. So I, I think we haven't spoken at all about the fact she's a woman, and I think that I think that has really mattered to her commission. She's the first woman president of the European Commission, but much more it's the tone she strikes. She at ease talks about children, she humanizes it. Uh, and I think that's been really important for this phase of European integration. So I, I, I think the fact she's a woman has actually had an impact and matters, not just symbolically, but much more substantially. And that is what, where you began, indeed, at the beginning you were talking um, about tone. And um, that is all we have time for. Um, I want to, on your behalf, to thank Mary Alice, David, uh, Bridget and John. Um, thank you to our hosts, obviously the European Commission, the European Parliament Liaison Office and, of course, the I. IEA. Um, it's great to be with you um, all again. Finally, thanks to you all for uh, turning out in person and all of those hundreds of you on YouTube. Uh, so thank you. And that brings to a close the State of the EU 22. <laughs> thank you.